everyone. My name is Ari and welcome to Made of Metal, a motivational podcast where we tell stories about regular people overcoming insurmountable odds. So welcome everyone to the first story of triumph for 2022. And what a pleasure it is to meet you here again. I hope everybody had a wonderful start to the new year. I am so jazzed to get back to telling you guys these amazing tales. Truly, I really feel refreshed and renewed and so ready to get the year going. So I wanted to kick off this year of Made of Metal with a doozy of a story about a person who played an enormous role in inspiring me to be who I am today, as well as likely millions and millions of other women around the globe. So you guys may not believe this, but I am a diehard card-carrying introvert with aspirations to write my poetry and stories while living in the woods with my gang of dogs in a cabin I've personally designed to include a stream running through it. Big ups to John Muir right there. Great writing for me is akin to bleeding on the paper, so to speak, as if the writer has imparted some of their essence into the words themselves. So when you read it, you absorb this unique energy, this unique experience. And it's a life-changing experience, honestly. Really good writing to me is a life-changing experience. And the person we'll be talking about today is one of the most awarded and quoted writers of all time. They created works that are read in studies in schools across the country today, alongside the other greats like Hemingway and Poe. Fun fact, we have the same birthday, me and Edgar Allan Poe. That's why I'm such a creep. (laughs) Having this sort of recognition is such an incredible feat for a number of reasons, but It'll be so obvious, I mean, glaringly so, after you hear about the trials and tribulations they had to suffer through to reach this level of success. So this person is the epitome of strength, resilience, and hope. And it's an absolute privilege and pleasure for me to share their story with you today. And also, just a quick ask from me, if you love the podcast and you really love listening to this bubbly baritone, please share this episode on social media, write me a review or rating wherever you're listening to it, or tell a friend. All of these little things help our podcast community grow, and we all thrive better together. So thank you in advance. And without further ado... Today, to kick off the new season, we'll be talking about the prestigious, the powerful, the poet, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was born in St. Louis, Missouri on April 4th, 1928, to her parents, Vivian and Bailey. Maya's birth name was Marguerite Annie Johnson, and she was the youngest child with an older brother named Bailey Jr. Bailey Jr. was the person who created the moniker of Maya, which was a term of endearment, essentially meaning my sister. That is so adorable. Already hitting me right in the feels and we've barely even begun. Due to a difficult home life, though, Maya's parents decided to go their separate ways when the children were very, very young. Bailey was only about a year older than Maya. So this resulted in the children moving in with their grandmother in Arkansas. Maya and her brother would live with their grandmother for about four years in relative peace before their father made a reappearance in their life and the children were sent back to live with their mother in St. Louis. Now, their mother was not the most involved maternal figure during their childhood, and Maya hadn't seen her for many years until that point. She was essentially a stranger. So after a year of living with their mother, the absolute unspeakable happened. And I did want to give a trigger warning for rape and sexual assault for people who aren't super familiar with Maya Angelou's story. Maya was raped and sexually assaulted by her mother's boyfriend, a truly horrible event. Although Maya was beyond traumatized, 
she had the strength to alert her brother, who then immediately told the rest of the family. Maya's abuser was captured, put on trial, found guilty of the assault, and jailed for a single day. So I was highly confused by that sentence, by the way, but after learning a bit more, I suspect there was some collusion going on to confirm or ensure he was only in jail for one day. For good reason. Maya's abuser was murdered four days after his release from jail. The rumors were that he was killed by Maya's family members. After dealing with these insanely tragic events and learning about her abuser's death, Maya became a mute for years. When later explaining the reasoning, Maya was quoted, I thought my voice killed him. I killed that man because I told his name. And then I thought I would never speak again because my voice would kill anyone. Man, now that quote, heartbreaking, absolutely heart-stopping because it clearly shows the innocence in her child mind at the time, somehow blaming herself for her abuser's well-deserved fate, I might add. But after this truly terrible series of events, Maya, along with her brother, again moved in with their grandmother. It was during the time period of Maya being mute, experiencing social isolation and inner silence, that she was able to discover her passion for reading, classic literature, writing, and the arts. Back in Arkansas with her grandmother, the children were sent to a local school where Maya was introduced to even more literature, authors, and poetry by a trusted teacher, Mrs. Flowers. Maya credits Mrs. Flowers with being the person who helped her find her voice again after all those years. A few years later, the children were back with their mother once again, who now lived in California. So much hopping around, and Maya was 14 at this time? (laughs) Just ridiculous. While in California, Maya was awarded a scholarship to study dance and acting at the California Labor School. This is where Maya's artistic creativity and skill for being a fantastic performer were further honed. Maya also fulfilled a lifelong dream of becoming a streetcar conductor in San Francisco. Actually, the first Black female streetcar conductor in the history of the job. Like, what, girl? You go. She would finish her labor program just three years later and would give birth to her first child in the same year. Maya is just straight out the gate. I just cannot fathom how a person can go through something so horrible and then just come out and just start kicking ass, like beyond commendable, beyond inspirational. She had accomplished all of this before she turned 17. And she is just getting started, y'all. Maya continued taking dance classes, working hard on improving her craft and networking along the way. Very important. While taking clashes, she'd connected with several choreographers who suggested they form a dance team together. It was around this time in 1951 that Maya would meet and marry her husband, Tosh, as well. Maya was already an incredible dancer, and with her husband's support, they moved the family to New York City for a year so she could study modern African dance with a renowned instructor. Around the early 1950s, after her failed marriage and dance team run, Maya's entertainment career truly began to blossom. Maya began dancing and singing in nightclubs, making a name for herself in the Calypso dance scene. It was around the mid-1950s that Maya landed a role in a major opera, Porgy and Bess, which was touring all around Europe, And she released an album titled Miss Calypso, which led to a Calypso production that showcased Maya's singing and dancing. And uh, if this wasn't impressive enough, I've got more for you. This is a really 
fun fact that I had to share because it demonstrates Maya's commitment to bettering herself, which is so difficult. Understanding your worth, acknowledging your worth after being exposed to the trauma that she had experienced as combined with the lack of support from her own mother. Maya would make a point to learn the language of each country she'd visited on her travels in Europe. Of course, the consequence of this, Maya learned how to speak several different languages. During her time in New York, around 1959, Maya was connected with an author named John Killens. John, bless his heart, could see all the magic in Maya's words and encouraged her to look deeper into developing her writing. Maya would become a member of the Harlem Writers Guild, would be published for the very first time, and would meet several iconic authors, such as Julian Mayfield. A year later, Maya had the, I mean, incredible opportunity to attend an event with Martin Luther King Jr. and the even more astounding gift to meet him. When Maya met Martin, she became even more passionate and involved in the civil rights efforts, organizing one of the most successful fundraisers to benefit the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The next decade would be busy and fruitful for Maya, but also fraught with loss and sorrow. In 1961, Maya and her son moved to Africa, where they lived for four years. While in Africa, Maya worked as an actress in Europe, as well as a newspaper editor. Maya remained a prominent figure in the local African-American community in Ghana, and she also began working at the University of Ghana. While working in Africa, Maya would connect with yet another iconic civil rights leader. And that leader, my dears, was named Malcolm X. By any means necessary. His autobiography, I think I read it like maybe 20 times, if not more. I just loved it so much. It was so good. Maya and Malcolm decided that they wanted to collaborate on creating an organization focused on civil rights in the States. I find it so mind-blowing that Maya met both Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. But knowing their histories, I find it incredibly tragic as well. Maya would return stateside to begin working with Malcolm in 1965. Tragically, Malcolm X was assassinated not long after, and Maya was in shock. This woman is literally living a Shakespearean play. Like, this is ugh, unbearable. Like, I can, I, I'm sure you guys can hear the absolute shock and stun in my voice. Just, what? Maya would continue moving around from Hawaii all the way back to New York, singing, writing, and performing her heart out. She eventually landed in New York again, where she reconnected with her old author friends, who helped her by providing a stipend while she continued to develop her writing. Maya was also able to reconnect with her old friend, the famous James Baldwin whom she called her brother, like, no big deal. Like, yeah, ugh, Jimmy Baldwin, that's just like my bro. What? You are cool, okay? You're cool and I'm not. In 1968, Maya was asked personally by Martin Luther King Jr. to organize a march, as Maya was so clearly dedicated and enthusiastic about helping the civil rights movement. After agreeing to help with the march, Martin Luther King Jr. would also be assassinated just a short time later. In that same year, Maya would write and produce her own documentary series about the origins of blues music being intertwined with African-American history and experience in America. 
She wrote this documentary for an early iteration of PBS called National Educational Television. And just as a reminder, Maya had almost zero experience with any aspect of actual production, let alone of a documentary series, as she'd primarily been a singer and actor for Broadway-level productions. Phew, I'm getting winded, okay, reading out this woman's accomplishments, y'all. Hang in there. In that same year, this is still 1968, Maya would write her landmark autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, which was then published that next year in 1969. In 1972, Maya produced and released a film, which was the first produced screenplay by a Black woman, which she also wrote the soundtrack for. Maya would continue her career in the arts, working as a composer, a writer, a poet, and a producer. She was also nominated for a Tony Award in 1973 for one of her roles and even began work as a theater director. I mean, this unstoppable, okay? Let's keep it going. Let's keep it rolling. Maya would continue to accumulate awards and accolades, eventually moving to North Carolina to accept a position at Wake Forest University as one of their full-time African-American professors. She taught a multitude of courses, from philosophy to theater. Maya would also become the first poet to make an inaugural recitation for Bill Clinton's inauguration in 1993, since Robert Frost did the same for John F. Kennedy in 1961, which she was also awarded a Grammy for the recording of that. There is so much more that Maya did and contributed to and created, such as make her directorial debut, finished her last autobiography, had the longest running record for a bestseller on the New York Times list, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. She also published several volumes of poetry, meditations, and other literature, even a cookbook all geared towards sharing either her story or the stories of others. In 2011, Maya donated many priceless items to charity, including her notes on her autobiographies, as well as relics from the civil rights era. I literally am losing my breath reading off of these things. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's just incredible. After a long run with health issues, Maya Angelou would pass away in her home in North Carolina on May 28th, 2014. Now, this story always, always, always brings me to tears. I'm actually really proud of myself for holding it together, honestly. This woman had to overcome circumstances and experience that many of us would not have survived, period. And I'm not just talking about the civil rights issues that were rampant in her era. Just as a reminder, she was a Black woman. So compared to the issues that were plaguing her own home life, I wonder how one could have the mental fortitude to survive a war that was happening at home and outside your front door. And Maya didn't just survive, you guys. Maya thrived. Beyond measure, the impact of Maya Angelou's work is imprinted on the very fabric of this nation. Okay, Maya Angelou is immortal in that her work and words live on forever as a set of blueprints on how to live authentically, how to rise after tragedy after tragedy. Never let life knock you down. And not to mention, just to tie it back into why this is so personal for me, Maya Angelou had a absent and toxic mother, as in a mother who didn't really participate in her maternal duties. So Maya didn't really have a great relationship with her mother. And having a toxic parent, having two toxic parents, actually, it's just, it really, really sets you back in terms of trusting people, trusting yourself, feeling worthy, feeling safe, all of these things that she was able to work through all of these issues and just kill it. 
nonstop. I mean, year after year. I just wonder if she ever took a year to just relax because she was just knocking it out the park. And she was eventually able to reconcile with her mother. She forgave her mother. She literally had the love in her heart to forgive her mother for the lack of a role in her life. I mean, this woman was as close to perfect as any of us will ever get to. I truly feel that way. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this story. I mean, whirlwind from start to finish, truly. And the fact that Maya Angelou is one of my greatest people, I just had to share this with you guys. So as always, you can check us out at madeofmetalpodcast.com and you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Made of Metal Podcast. We are really taking this year and expanding and growing and making things better for you guys. I want to build a community that we can all lean on, authentic, genuine, and healing and helpful. Each one teach one. We can all learn from each other. So as always, my loves, thank you so much for listening and bloom where you are planted.